Derby County have been relegated from the Championship to League One after a 21-point penalty in the season uh, just gone. And in today's video, we're going to talk about how and why that happened. I'm joined by JJ Bull and Elias Burke to do so. The points deduction and relegation took place at the end of the most uh, recent season, but our story starts all the way back in 2014, Elias, because in 2014, Derby lost in the championship playoff final. They did the same again in 2019, and it's between those two dates that the problems started to arise. Yeah, and that's when Mel Morris bought the club. In 2014, he bought an, a minority stake into the club, and then the year later, he bought the whole club, invested pretty heavily into the squad, into the playing staff, um, and unfortunately, most of those investments that you made didn't have a great return, and it left Derby in a bit of a pickle. Yeah, okay, so this is the beginning of the points deduction. Elias and I, let's go, let's go over to the board, because we can talk a little bit more about those player signings. So here we have Derby County's uh, transfer market spends from the 2013-14 season all the way until uh, the most recent season, Elias. And we can start to see the black here is uh, the outgoing, right? Yeah, and that's about when the 2014-15 season is when Mel Morris came into the club, the season after they, they, um, they lost in the playoff final. You can see the outgoings have really started there. So the first year wasn't too bad. They invested kind of very minimal amounts. And the next season, obviously, in the 2015-16 season is the one where he really, you know, he bought the club and kind of tried to scale the club's ambitions from a team that was around the playoffs and around the kind of top half of the league into one that was really kind of investing heavily into promotion. So a 30, 31 million pounds of outlays. So that's, you know, very expensive for, you know, for a, for a championship club. That's Zero been, incomings here this well, season exactly. as well. Well, that's, exactly, and that's been the kind of big problem. If you can really kind of compare it to the other seasons where it's kind of fairly comparative, um, the outgoings and the incomings are okay. That season's one that took a massive um, outlay out of the club and didn't get any money back, essentially. Yeah, okay. So for people watching, uh, we can see that the, the, the figure in white here is the net spend, and that's because uh, in the 2017-18 se uh, season, Derby made £19.15 million from sales, and they only spent £11 million. So when the white is above this central line, that's not bad. But it's really here that is the problem. And presumably, Elias, that is because this season here, they nearly were promoted to the Premier League. So an owner coming in might think, well, a little bit of investment here, and we can make a lot more money. Exactly, and that's that was kind of the the whole plan under Morris. He came in. He was a you know, he's a Derby fan. It's kind of a self-made millionaire essentially, and he's really tried to invest into the club and take Derby into what he thinks is kind of the promised land. You know, a club with big history, a big stadium. They had the ambitions of really kind of getting into the Premier League. So that kind of outlay there, it, it was all it was kind of a in his interests really to kind of make that first that first transfer window one where he thinks let's spend a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, he's obviously spent a lot there and... Uh, Let's see who he spent it on as well. Yeah. So this is the season we're referring to. Now these aren't all of the, the transfers that have happened, these are just some of the standout ones. Tell us a little bit about these, these players. I think the one kind of common trend really between the players is there wasn't any kind of money made, other than Vidra, who they sold later on for a fair amount. Bradley Johnson was sold on a free transfer, Tom Ince was sold for a bit of a profit, Tom Lawrence looks expectant to leave this summer for a free transfer. Martin Waghorn left last summer, free transfer. Christian Bielik, now that Derby have been, of course, relegated to League One, he's got ambitions of playing at the World Cup this summer. It's not the best look if he's playing in League One and trying to go to the World Cup. Even the Poland manager has said, you know, that's not the best look for him and he probably won't make it into the squad if he's playing in the third tier. Mm. So he's going to go. And Jozwiak went earlier this year for half the price that they bought him for from to an MLS club, which is... That's no good. Not good at all. No. Okay. Well, we were talking before about the 21-point deduction that, that, that Derby incurred. Twelve of that came from being in administration, right? Which is essentially uh, a fancy term for not having enough money to pay your debts. Good, good stuff. Here's the debt. Can you explain this to me, please, Elias? Well, I think the, immediately the thing that strikes out is the kind of £30 million owed to HMRC. Her which Majesty's is, Royal Customs. Yeah, which is yeah. massive, especially because HMRC is the one kind of company that you really, well, not company, the one organisation that you really don't want to owe money to. You don't want to have to owe money to the Queen. Exactly. And normally, actually, in previous years, in previous administrations, it wasn't too bad because it was one of the, one of the debts that you could kind of really cram down. Mm. But since they were made preferential creditor in 2020, it means that you've got to pay them everything, essentially, and HMRC don't take haircuts. 
So if they've got 30 million pound owed to HMRC, and the average League One club is, is worth about 20, 30 million pound. I think Sunderland has got the biggest valuation, they're getting promoted to the championship, and they're worth about 30 million pounds. If they owe that to one, one, you know, one organization, then it's not particularly attractive. No, um, that's not To say good. the least. Okay, what's this, the 10 million pounds in orange for Arsenal? So that's the, the kind of one debt that they have to pay. So Arsenal are a football creditor. Um, and obviously it's, it's for Bielik as you can see, so in, I think in the 2018 summer they bought Bielik for, for £10 million. So they have to pay that back because they're a football creditor. And the £20 million owned to, to MSD is where a big problem's kind of started with the stadium. Um, Derby O, Mal Morris owns the stadium at the moment and he's trying to sell that to whoever's trying to buy the club. Mm. And um, MSD has a, a loan guaranteed against the stadium. Great. So um, he's kind of looking to shift that as soon as possible really. Okay, fine. Well, you can go and sit down now, Elias. I'm done with you for the time being. Uh, because uh, we've addressed the, the 12 points of the 21 point uh, penalty deduction that Derby incurred for uh, going into administration. The other nine points come from something else, something very fun. JJ and Ellis, it's called amortization. Who wants to learn about amortization? I do. I don't, but I'll tell you anyway. Now, here you can see at the top, this is a typical amortization line. And I'm gonna uh, emphasize, this is a hypothetical example. This is not what the club have, these, are, these aren't official figures, this is a hypothetical. At the top here, we can see a typical amortization line. Now, what is amortization? Well, amortization is an accounting practice by which you account for loss in your bank accounts. Very fun, right? Exactly. At a football club, you think about the sorts of assets that a football club would have, they're mostly players. And players, because of the Bosman ruling, when they reach the end of their contract, they're worth no money anymore because they can walk away for free. So all we know about a player as an asset arriving at a football club is what you paid for them at the beginning. And in this hypothetical example of Tom Lawrence, seven million pounds, a very bad hypothetical example because I think it costs five million pounds, but we'll move on anyway. We know that he costs seven million pounds at the beginning and at the end of his contract, he'll be worth zero million pounds. Now, amortization generally works through this straight line process. So you can see that 1.4 million pounds has been removed or has been lost off that contract by the time you reach the end of the first year. And then when you get to the end of the second year, it's 4.2 and so on until you go down to zero. What Derby County were doing is a little bit different to that. And it's a little more complicated than them just breaking the rules. There was some back and forth with the EFL over it. Uh, but this is what they incurred that extra nine point penalty for. Now in this case, they would purchase Tom Lawrence for seven million pounds. But after the first season, instead of reducing him to 5.6 million, hypothetically, they might say, well, we think actually he's still a pretty good player. He's got four years left on his contract. He's probably not going anywhere. If anything, he's retained some of his value. So we're not gonna drop him all the way down to 5.6. We're gonna say he's worth six million pounds instead. And that therefore would be reflected in the accounts. At the end of the following year, instead of dropping him to 4.2 million, they'll say, well, we think he's in three years left on his contract. He's probably still worth 5.5, so we'll do that. You can see the issue here as we get towards the end is that they've massively backloaded the drop. And uh, between the final year of his contract and at the end of his contract, there's a 3.5 million pound gap versus the 1.4 million pound here. Now, the reason that they would do this are a couple fold. One is that in the accounts it reflects a little bit less of a loss than they would have actually made over that period of time. That wouldn't ordinarily be a problem, but the issue is that all other football clubs are following various sustainability rules, either FFP or rules that the domestic leagues have themselves, uh, and they're trying not to break those rules because if they do, they incur penalties. Now, if one team is doing something different, that's a problem. That's, that's, are we allowed to call it cheating? <laughs> <laughs> Some people have. Some people have called it cheating they were given a nine point penalty for it. Uh, and the sad thing about that is that if Derby had just gone into administration and had that 12 point deduction, Wayne Rooney's team would not have been relegated. But because they got the extra nine points, they fell below Reading, I think, and were relegated. Um, and the reason that's sad is uh, because Wayne Rooney's team, JJ, they really weren't that bad, were they? Yes. Yes. This is how Wayne Rooney's Derby County play. So the shape tends to be a 4-2-3-1 or a 4-3-3. He's used a 3-4-3 in different times in the season. But the problem Rooney has had is that his squad has been 
sort of torn apart by people leaving during the season and injuries and all sorts of things going on. So a lot of the players are very young, players like Ebi Owe and uh, oh, we've got Bird here and Cashin, they're all really, really young players. So Rooney's to get these into a team that works. But what we know that Rooney likes in this team is to keep possession and to try and attack and press from the front. So whichever shape they're playing, this is what they do. But what I've also noticed from watching a lot of them is that they tend to attack in diamonds and they don't send too many players forward. And it kind of correlates with the numbers that you get. So they've got 51.3% average possession for the season, which puts them, I think it's eighth in the championship table in terms of possession. So they're one of the, the teams in that league who keeps the ball the most. Um, but they had the fewest, some of the fewest shots per game in that league as well. So they've got lots of possession, but they're not taking shots. And their expected goals is above what their actual goals is, which means they're missing chances that they are creating. This is bad, but they're quite nice to watch. And what you see is that they've got, uh, like a lot of teams to have, they have attacking fullbacks who get up and down the wings, um, tend to have two holding midfielders here. It's Christian Bielik, you might remember him from being at Arsenal once. Um, and yeah, they attack this little diamond. Now Tom Lawrence is the absolute key here. He's been the best player for them this season. The player of the season actually is Byrne, the right back, but Lawrence has been phenomenal. Scored a couple of goals against Sheffield United, which were both uh, nominated for goal of the season, I think. He's a really good player. But it all starts from building from the back. So the goalkeeper has been described by Rooney as being one of his playmakers. So the, the centre backs will split when they're trying to build, and then one of the midfielders will drop in to create a diamond. So we get diamonds all over the pitch. That's one of they get. And when they attack, he'll get the forwards, the most furthest forward player, the striker. There'll be a ten behind him. There'll be two wide forwards or wingers, we ever call them, and they form a diamond. And make sure they keep the depth and the width. So we've got width to try and stretch the defence, and you get depth to make sure that. Um, you just have players in position that can help you build plays and get uh, together. So when they attack forward like this, you get the, the diamond, the fullbacks push up a little bit, but not too far. So it'll sort of resemble, I don't know, they don't push too many players forward. So although they've got lots of possession, they don't actually get enough players forward to cause trouble for the opposition, which is why the shots per game is so low. But then the benefit of having this sort of diamond shape is if you get the ball out wide, as they often do, and the ball, say that you've got Lawrence here, and you've got Planch here, and you've got Eboe here, Eboe, I should say, Ball comes in here, maybe Lange gets a shot away, keeper parries it or it hits the bar. Then there's someone following in from deep who can hit the rebound and there's a couple of goals they've scored this season which are just like that. Other goals they've scored have been from delivery from wide areas, particularly from set pieces, a lot of headers they've scored. Um, but they then keep possession and I think the reason they're trying to do this high possession thing rather than play on the counter attack, which is what you'd associate this thing with, is that with uh, lots of possession and pushing the, the line high up into the opposition half, it means you can get more players closer together so you get nice combinations. So you get one twos from players like Morrison linking with Plange or Lawrence linking with Plange or Morrison or whoever is there. So you get lots of one twos, they'll make play it here, they'll make a run and get it back. A few goals that they scored this season doing that sort of thing. And by having more players forward like this, without committing them too far, it means that if they do lose the ball with one of these kind of combinations to create a, a chance to score, they've got players in possession, or sorry, players in position to prevent an opposition counter-attack. And that helps them to avoid scoring goals, because if, you, uh, if your opposition doesn't have the ball, they can't score, in theory. And so that's how I think Wayne Rooney's Derby play. Does that make sense, Elias? Is that correct? That's perfect. <laughs> I'm going to sit down now. Come back. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I'm back. Thank you. Elias, what can we expect in the future for Derby? I mean, it's an impossible question to answer because you don't know. Well, that's a big problem, essentially, that the takeover hasn't happened yet. We think Rooney's going to stay. I mean, he's shown all the right signs of someone that's going to stay. He's invested in the club from, from next season. He, he's looking at players. He, he's, you know, he's attracted his targets. He's speaking to prospective owners and prospective chief executives. But as I say, they're perspective right now we don't know if they're going to take over the club mm. uh, but he's spoken to players about players signing new contracts um, he's starting to build his what he thinks the identity should be in, in League One and how that kind of translates from playing in the championship to playing in League One so he's thought about all of that he said that he wants to stay um, so hopefully this takeover can, can get done as soon as possible and, and you know, we can see. It must be a, a bit of a draw, just on his own. Right? Well, like, that's the reason why people are interested in Derby from the outside, at least anyway, because <laughs> Wayne Rooney's, you know, it's, it's Wayne Rooney, he's probably England's best player of his generation. He was good. Yeah, so naturally people are interested in what he's got to do post-retirement. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's been a good story, as I say, like, you know, the administration and the points deductions and how he's galvanised a team of kind of a ragtag team of really experienced players. You know, the thing about Derby is they're both very old and very young. And it's kind of a, you know, it must be a strange dynamic to try and coach with so many experienced players. Mm. 
but at the same time so many players that are 18, 19, 20 and how you kind of get them all together playing from the same hymn sheet essentially. Who's it you're saying Ebio is 18, is that right? And Ebio is like, he's serious, like we all think that he's going to be one of the best players to come out of Derby in a long time. Yeah. I mean he came up through Arsenal, he's already played for um, Nigeria's youth teams, England's youth teams. Netherlands youth teams, wow. very, he's very eligible. He's a tiny yeah. player. And then the, the centre-back partnership, so um, Curtis Davies has got a lot of experience, but then he's playing with a boy, what's his? Uh, Aaron Cashin. Aaron Cashin. Yeah. So that was like, at the start of the season, Derby's defence was, that, that's kind of the bedrock that Rooney kind of built everything from, and that's when they had Jagielka as well. Jagielka had to leave in kind of uncertain terms because of Derby not being able to offer them a contract. Same way, because Graham Shinney had to get sold for 30 grand. Exactly, 30 in grand. Um, As Aberdeen's captain, he's a brilliant player. Yeah. 30 grand. 30 grand, exactly. Um, and that was, as I say, that was the bedrock. And then we weren't really sure what was going to happen with Derby from that point. You know, we thought maybe they could spiral. But then Cashin kind of emerged and he looks like a really promising player. He's an Ireland youth international now. and. I think everyone's really excited about a kind of centre-back partnership next season of Davis and Cashin for sure. Mm. Okay, well there we go. That was Derby Football Club. Thanks very much for joining us. Elias Burke, thank you. And if you want to read more about Derby and Elias's work, you can do so by visiting theathletic.com forward slash, there's a link below the video. I don't know what the URL is. Do go and do that though. Thank you, JJ. Yes. Bye. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Daniel Taylor, Ollie Kay, Amy Lawrence and Rafa Honigstein. There are journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.